All right, let's go ahead and begin the, uh, the second talk on the kingdom of God. Now, I've got the papers arranged for you all so that on one side you've got the notes and on the other side you've got a map. And we're going to be using both of these pages as we go through this talk. So, in chapters 5 through 8, Jesus and his disciples are on the move. They are going all over the place, and where they go has a lot of significance. But that significance is not easy to visualize without a map. So, what I have for you here on that third page is a map of the areas that Jesus visited in the Gospel of Mark. And what I've done is I've annotated the map with chapter and verse reflecting Jesus being at that spot, at that chapter and verse. So for instance, towards the bottom, right north of the Dead Sea, you've got one colon five. That's Jesus being baptized in the Jordan River at one five. Uh, but in this section, we're really in the northern part of the map in the region of Galilee, largely. So the city of Capernaum is the home base for Jesus and his followers. And you probably notice that he returns to Capernaum frequently uh, throughout. So 114, 521, 933, which is next week, are all um, in the area of Capernaum. When he crossed to heal the demoniac from Capernaum, uh, 5 colon 1 is where he landed, and that's on the eastern side there. So that location in particular is a spot where the physical geography of the area is such that it's got the right kind of cliff for the uh, pigs to have uh, jumped off in terms of the details of that passage. And so that's probably roughly where that occurred. Then, um, you know, he goes back to Capernaum after that. Then he does a land journey down to Nazareth. Uh, so that's 6-1. Then um, he and the 12 journey to just many villages of Galilee. And so you can think of that as being largely west of the Sea of Galilee there in the middle. Uh, they then do a sea crossing to Bethsaida. That's 645. And that's on the northeast part of the, uh, the lake. Then they do an overland journey to Tyre, which is on the Mediterranean Sea. So that's actually a fairly long trip. That was about 35 miles, roughly. Um, so obviously it took them a few days to get to Tyre. Then there's some vague language of going back through the area of the Decapolis. I'm going to talk more about the Decapolis in a moment. Um, and so that takes us um, through 733, which is getting to the southeastern region that's southeast of the lake. Then they go back across to Dalmanutha. That's 810 going across the lake. Then they do a short trip to Bethsaida. Um, 822, um, same as 645, I don't think I put 822 on the map. And then they do an overland journey to Caesarea Philippi, 827. But the deeper significance of what's going on here is the nature of whom he's visiting. The region of Galilee to the west of the Sea of Galilee was primarily inhabited by Jews who were primarily speaking the Aramaic language. And in fact, Mark even gives us a little bit of Aramaic for some color um, in places. So, for instance, when he's healing uh, the daughter of Jairus in uh, 541, he says, Talitha kumi, 
which means, little girl, I say to you, arise. So Mark quotes the Aramaic line that Jesus spoke and then translates it into Greek for his readers. Right there. So, and then later, when we've got the uh, healing of the blind man, or no, the deaf man, sorry, in 734, he said to him, Ephatha, that is, be opened. It's Aramaic being spoken there. So that's the dominant language of that area, and the dominant culture, religious views, is a heavily, heavily Jewish environment. The Decapolis, not so much. The Decapolis is a region of Greek-speaking pagan cities. So, specifically, the cities of the Decapolis include um, Hippus, Dion, Kanatha, Raphana, Gadara, Gerasa, Pella, Scythopolis, which is, unlike most of them, slightly on the other side of the Jordan, Philadelphia, not that Philadelphia, uh, Damascus, uh, Caesarea Philippi. So those are Greek-speaking pagan regions. And there are interesting clues about this. So when he first crosses the Lepernum to hear the Gerasene demoniac, the demons ask to be able to possess the pigs. Well, if this were a Jewish area, there wouldn't be a herd of pigs, right? The fact that there's a herd of pigs is very significant for helping us see, oh, yeah, these aren't Jews. These are pagans, in fact. So let's think more about that episode. We're, we're going to go back to that episode uh, one more time after this, too, because there's just so much going on with it. So Jesus comes to heal the Gerasene demoniac. And note that this is the first time that Jesus makes a visit to Gentile territory. It's as if the evil concentrated in that part of the Sea of Galilee was so tremendous that he knew he had to do something about it. And so he did. So let's look at the details. Like I said, this is horror movie territory. He had often been bound with shackles and chains, but the chains he wrenched apart, and the shackles he broke in pieces, and no one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains he was always crying out and bruising himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran, and crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For Jesus has said to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, What is your name? Now, why does Jesus ask for his name? In asking for his name, he asserts authority over the unclean spirit. He's basically telling the unclean spirit, Your time here is at an end. He replied, my name is Legion, for we are many. So what's the significance of that? A legion, right, was a military unit of the Romans, and a really numerous one. The demon is boasting at this point. But there's also another aspect to this, which is that this legion of demons represents some kind of primordial chaos. It's not human to live like that. We're created in the image of God with a single intelligent rational soul. This isn't the way it's meant to be. And Jesus is going to straighten it out. So. He allows them into the swine, and they're drowned. That is bizarre. No two ways about it. Why Jesus acceded to their request is a bit of a puzzle. 
best guess is that for whatever reason, whoever the owner of the swine was or whatever, in his infinite wisdom, Jesus saw fit that the swine perish. Um, don't have much more beyond that. Um, it occurs to me to suggest also that the death of the swine is in part a sign of the lack of efficacy of the pagan gods, that the death of the swine represents the fact that the God of Israel is indeed supreme over those pagan gods that they worshipped. So then what happens? People came to see what it was that had happened. They came to Jesus and saw the demoniac sitting there clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. And those who seen it told what had happened to the demoniac and to the swine. And they began to beg Jesus to depart from their neighborhood. Asking Jesus to leave. Now, here's a spiritual lesson. They asked Jesus to leave, and he left. They asked Jesus to leave, and he did as they asked. He left. Now, isn't that an insight into the soul haunted by sin? The soul dominated by sin asks Jesus to leave, and Jesus leaves that soul. What theologians call a loss of sanctifying grace. Now, what happens to the demoniac? This is really interesting. The man who had been possessed with demons begged him that he might be with him. But Jesus refused and said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And all men marveled. This isn't the end of the story. You know what is? It's chapter 7, verse 31. So, chapter 7, verse 31. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee through the region of the Decapolis. So, we look back at, the end, at that bit of chapter 5. He went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. So the cured demoniac has gone on his own preaching tour in those ten pagan cities. Which interestingly parallels the preaching and healing tour that Jesus and the disciples are undertaking at the same time in Galilee. In the sending of the twelve. So he goes, he proclaims all this good news in the Decapolis. Jesus and company return to the Decapolis. And immediately, they bring him the deaf mute man. Now, how do they follow this up? A whole bunch of them gather, and ultimately, Jesus needs to feed them. We'll come back to this in a few moments. But the point here is that the mission to the Greek pagans is bearing concrete fruit already. The demoniac, that's not just a little throwaway story. It's actually a key part of the overall trajectory of the, of the ministry of Jesus as depicted herein. Let's back up just a little bit, though, and uh, check on another pagan that he visits, the Syrophoenician woman. So this is just, on, uh, just a little bit further back in chapter 7. So this is an interesting situation. Jesus had just gotten done with a fairly nasty dispute with the Pharisees. 
And so he leaves Capernaum by land going up to Tyre. And it says, and he entered a house and would not have anyone know it. In other words, Jesus, the very human Jesus in this moment, is exhausted. He's getting out of town just to try to relax a bit. But lo and behold, he could not be hidden. And a woman whose little daughter was possessed by an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell down at his feet. Now the woman was a Greek, a Syrophoenician by birth. And she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he said to her, Let the children first be fed, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Now, that sounds pretty rude. It kind of is. But Jesus clearly is giving her a bit of a test at this point. She's, she's going to have to fight for it. And he wants her to fight for it. And she does. She answered him, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And let's think about this for a moment. On one level, this is the Syrophoenician woman being witty and clever and turning his phrase around back to him in the moment. And we can appreciate it on that level. But there's another level, which is that she's talking not about a single dog, but the dogs. Knowingly or unknowingly, in this moment, she is interceding with Jesus, not only for herself, but for all Gentiles. In this moment, she is praying that the dogs, the Gentiles, receive the blessings that Jesus is offering. And this is an important part about what Mark is teaching about the kingdom of God in this section, that the kingdom of God is inclusive of all peoples without distinction. And so it's no accident in terms of the narrative that after this, Jesus does not immediately return to Galilee. Instead, he heads to the Decapolis. Why? Because he has heeded the intercession of the Syrophoenician woman asking that even the dogs are ready for some table scraps. And he set it up with the healing of the garrison demoniac earlier on. The people are ready for his blessings at this point. So he not only helps her, heals the Gentile deaf man, and then he feeds, feeds the Gentiles. So let's take some time now, speaking of feeding and food, and I'm glad this is more of an after-dinner kind of a presentation rather than a pre-meal presentation. Uh, but he does two feedings, two miraculous feedings here. And my own experience when I first um, had the exercise of sitting down and reading the Gospel of Mark as a whole was I honestly didn't even know there were two feedings. I knew about the 5,000. I didn't even know about the 4,000. That sort of grabbed me out of nowhere, actually, the first time I encountered it by reading the narrative as a whole. But it has a lot of significance, and they both do, and the parallels between them do. So let's explore them a bit. So first, looking at the first miracle of the loaves, this is Mark 6.30. The apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. So the context here is that the twelve had gone out on their mission. They were returning from the mission, and they were exhausted. And he said to them, come away by yourselves to a lonely place and rest a while. Jesus is basically saying, 
apostles, job well done, you've earned a break. But people saw them and followed them as they do. They went away in a boat to a lonely place by themselves. Now many saw them going and knew them and ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. They must have been going pretty fast. Usually water travels a little faster than land travel. So it is. As he landed, he saw a great throng, and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. And when it grew late, his disciples came and said, send them out of here. And remember the context. They were exhausted. They're done. They're like, Phew. And he answered them, you give them something to eat. They said to him, well, how, how are we going to do that? We've only got five loaves and two fishes. But it works out. They hand it out. The 5,000 are fed. And they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. The detail about the 12 baskets is that this symbolizes Jesus' mission to the Jewish people. Right? They've been preaching in the villages of Galilee. The preaching has hit a chord. It has hit a response. They are pursued. He gives them what they need because they are sheep without a shepherd. The Jewish authorities are not doing their job. So Jesus is ready to do that. So we've got that. Now, let's look at the feeding of the 4,000. So this is chapter 8 starting at verse 1. I have compassion on the crowd because they have been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. The three days is a detail that Mark emphasizes because the initial mission of Jesus is to the Jewish people. The Gentiles have had to wait. And it turns out here they've been waiting for three days for their feeding. But nevertheless, the dogs, so to speak, are going to receive the children's scraps in abundance. So how many baskets are left over now? There are seven. Seven baskets left over. And the, the detail of there being seven baskets is the number seven represents all the nations of the world, all the peoples of the world. Now, although this is admittedly uh, clearer in some ways in uh, the Gospel of John in particular, the Eucharistic significance of the multiplication of the loaves here is not to be underestimated. Let's look back at the Syrophoenician woman. Jesus said to her, Let the children first be fed, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Yes, Lord, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Jesus came to offer himself. He hints at that by using the metaphor of food. Ultimately, it will be fed by his own body. And what we have to remember, right, is that the gospel has been written in the context of and presented to a community that is actively celebrating the sacraments, most especially the Eucharist. So in the context of a community that's celebrating the Eucharist, the significance just jumps right out. Especially when it gets followed up by the feeding of the 4,000. After three days, how long is he going to be in the tomb? Three days. As one of the fruits of his death and resurrection, he makes his body present for all Jew and Gentile who wish to partake of what he has to offer. So we see a sacramental significance to his ministry here 
a sacramental significance that, of course, is what the church he founded carries forward after his death and resurrection. And, and it's an interesting detail that throughout this section, Jesus physically touches those whom he heals. The woman with the hemorrhage reaches out and touches his cloak and is healed and has faith that if she touches his cloak, she will be healed. The deaf man, the detail is visceral, right? Because you can imagine Mark taking notes as Peter narrates the tale that he witnessed. He put his fingers into his ears and spat and touched his tongue. And his ears were opened and his tongue was loosened. Ultimately, Jesus wishes us to experience his blessings and his ministry through the physical medium of touch, which is what we have through the sacraments of the Catholic Church. So again, we'll pause uh, for five minutes or so of reflection time, and here are some things to reflect on. First, a major theme of this section is the inclusion of all peoples in the kingdom of God as emphasized by his ministry to the Gentiles and parallel to the ministry to the Jewish people. So prayerfully consider to what person or people might Jesus be calling you personally to reach out to at this time in the context of your life. Second question to ponder, again, just as the Spirit moves you, in what ways have the sacraments enabled or sustained you in your own spiritual journey? So go ahead and take five minutes to ponder this, and then at 8 o'clock we'll, we'll have the third and final talk.